Uh, Mark, well, our final, final author of the evening. I've only been into um, a few prisons, but the workshops I did there were enough to convince me of something that, to be honest, I knew was true even before I went in, which is that whilst any group you work with has a really interesting range of individuals in it, the experience of doing workshops with those groups is always pretty much exactly the same. It doesn't matter who they are. I've worked with kids of eight years old in the school. I've worked with people who are over 80. I've worked with prisoners. I've worked with girls, teenage girls from a private school. It's all the same. Actually, the teenage girls from a private school were bloody hard work, but that's the <laughs> tell you just about one workshop I did because I think it illustrates some of the really important things that happen in those workshops. It's a visit I did with Irene over there and it was um, a secure unit for young offenders. We had eight young men in the workshop. We sat down together I told them a little bit about myself. Um, I never do readings because I think if you read at someone it's rather poor value for money. I mean the guys are trapped there all the time. It's bad enough to drag them into the room and trap them in front of you again. <laughs> Then we talked a little bit about the books they were reading, the ones among them who were reading. It was everything from Tupac Shakur's autobiography to Dostoyevsky's notes from the underground, which is a good survey of prison reading, I think. <laughs> then we did a workshop. And it's a workshop I borrowed from a friend of mine who also teaches, William Fines, who's a wonderful writer and a great teacher. And he calls it Being Ten. Get everyone to close their eyes. And we talk about what it was like when they were ten. What was your bedroom like? What's on the wall? What's on the television? What did the kitchen look like? What did you have for breakfast? What did you have for supper? What could you see out of the living room window? Where did you play outside? What was your school like? What were the names of your teachers? When we've done that for a while and everyone's got into that way of thinking, open our eyes again and get a piece of paper and a pencil. Or in this case, in the case of one of the guys who did have literacy problems, he was just going to make a list inside his head, and that was absolutely fine. And then getting everyone to keep their pencil on the paper, he started off by saying, what can you taste when you're 10? Leave them for a few minutes to write that, then what can you smell when you're 10? What can you hear? What can you see? What are the feelings? What can you touch in that picture in your head? Spent about 15 minutes doing this, and then we stopped. Then I get everyone to read out what they've written, and in the case of this one guy, just to tell us what he'd been thinking about this list inside his head. But several things happen, which <coughs> always happen, whoever that group of people are. First thing is, everyone's really nervous. Mm -hmm. And these are quite big guys who want to swagger sometimes, but reading out in front of other people is quite a scary thing to do. Everyone <coughs> always reads. The most confident person starts, and people see what's happening, and by the end, everyone wants to do it. The other thing that happens is it's always interesting. <coughs> there's no swagger in what they're writing, there's no adventure, there's no great thrills. Just talking about your childhood to other people is really fascinating for them. It makes you realise that the stuff you thought was boring about your life is actually really <coughs> interesting material. Then strange things happen as well. It happened to at least two of the guys in this group of eight, and it always happens in a group. For some magical reason, as they're writing this list of things they can taste and smell and touch, they find themselves writing a story. Two wonderful stories came out of that group, and I remember one of them very vividly. The young guy I was talking about when he was ten, he and his mate used to break into abandoned warehouses at night, and they put roller skates on, and they skate round in the pitch darkness with these sort of smashed open new windows at the side. <coughs> One evening they were doing this, and they were standing at the side putting their skates on, and they heard someone cough really loudly nearby. And then he described how difficult it is to get out of a smashed warehouse window when you're wearing roller skates, <laughs> thinking someone is going to kill you. <laughs> There's something else that always happens. There's always at least one person in the group to whom this happens. This was a guy who was sitting in the corner, least willing to join in. We could see him right at the beginning. I knew who he was, and I was thinking, you're the one I want. We've got to kind of bring you into the fold, haven't we? And he was all curled up in himself. He was uncomfortable. He did the exercise, though, and he was 
the last person to read, I think. I can't really remember what he wrote about it because my memory is so clouded by the response. He started reading and after a few sentences, there was a kind of stillness in the room. You know when you're at the theatre and it all comes right? And everyone went, everyone else could hear that it's brilliant. And then what was great was he noticed that everyone else was noticing that it was brilliant. And I got a tear in the corner of my eye. And I think some of those rather some butch guys might have done it as well. <laughs> That's the kind of gold dust I'm always looking for in a writer's workshop. It's not rare, it's not uncommon. If you know what you're doing, you can get it every single time. And what happens then is people who often think their own lives have no real value realize that even just the ordinary stuff in their lives is fascinating. I want to end by saying a couple of things. One I've learned from that, the one thing I've learned from that is that you can be literary without literacy. Even people who have real literacy problems can learn to tell stories that move other people. And if you can persuade them that that's an exciting thing to do, then you get the literacy as a kind of side order with it. Because once you think you can do that, you want to you learn how to write better, you want to learn how to read better, because you want to get into that world. Second thing, I'd love to have gone back. Well, the prison was a very long way, and a lot of these visits are kind of one-off thing. I would love a system where all the writers out there who, who'd love to go into prisons, because frankly, you're right, we sit at home all day, you know, we really like to get out of the house. I mean, <laughs> you, you draw on that pool of writers and you link them up with a prison which is near them and they can go in regularly because it is a fantastic feeling to kind of open that window for people to this kind of bright, fascinating world. It's really sad to go away and think that window is going to close again. It would be lovely to keep those windows open for as long as possible. Thanks. Thank you.